Hey there, this Android bit is about annotation processing. We are going to discuss what annotation processing is, why do we use it, and where does it fit in the overall build flow. So let's start with the notion of an annotation. Annotation is a language construct, it starts with this add symbol, and in this case it sits on top of this function. This annotation, well, basically annotates the function in this case. But annotations are not limited to functions, you can use them with parameters, with properties, with fields, with entire classes, etc. So this is an annotation. To understand where annotation processing fits into the overall build flow, let's just remind ourselves how this build flow looks like. So we've got source code and then we have resources, for example, images, and we add configuration files, Gradle configuration files on top of that, fit this everything into build process, and this build process yields APK files that we distribute to our users. Now, the build process itself consists of multiple steps. It starts with pre-processing, and then compilation, and then packaging, and finally post-processing. And of course, Gradle build system orchestrates all of that. Each of these steps is actually a number of steps, so you can kind of double click on each of them and go into the details. And actually the annotation processing takes place during compilation step. So what we want to do now is to double click on the compilation step to understand how it looks in more detail. So let's do that. Compilation step starts with front end compilation. And again, even front end compilation is kind of a compound step. There are multiple steps performed there, but we are not going to get into this level of details in this video. So front end compilation and then annotation processing after front end compilation. That's exactly the topic of this uh, lecture. And then we have back end compilation. And finally, back end compilation yields so called class file. That's the bytecode that then gets converted to DEX code and being distributed inside APK files. So annotation processing basically happens between the front end of the compilation step and the back end of the compilation step. And one very interesting question to ask here is, well, backend compilation yields bytecode, but what kind of a format is used to pass data from the front-end compilation step to annotation processing and from annotation processing further to backend compilation? And the answer is that abstract syntax tree data structures are used to pass data from the front-end compilation step to annotation processing and then from annotation processing to uh, the backend compilation step. Abstract syntax tree, AST in short, are three representations of the abstract syntactic structure of the source code. Well, this is a very well abstract <laughs> description of what IST is, but basically you can imagine that this front-end compilation step basically took the source code and produced some tree-like structure that captures the essence of the source code. And the reason why we use tree data structure is because trees are much simpler to traverse, right? You can use so-called breadth first search or for example, a depth first search or some combination of thereof. So AST is just a format that is simpler to use and annotation processing takes in your source code in the format of AST and does something to it before passing it further to backend compilation step. Well, what does annotation processing do? Well, let's discuss the use cases for annotation processing. The first one is chord generation. Annotation processing can basically inspect AST and find out which elements are annotated and perform some code generation, add the code, generate code uh, based on those specifications. And of course, the best examples of code generating annotation processors in the Android uh, ecosystem will be, for example, Room library, which takes in your annotations on the entity classes and generates databases and tables from them, and Dagger dependency ingestion framework, which takes your annotations on classes, etc., and generates dependency injection um, infrastructure inside your application. So these are code generation uh, annotation processors. In addition, you can use annotation processors for validation. And for example, in Java, we don't have like in Kotlin, uh, you know, typed new ability. We have all these non-null and nullable annotations. And then various tools can process these annotations to find instances where you use your uh, nullability incorrectly. For example, when you use some nullable argument without checking it for being null. In addition, you can use annotation processing to generate resources. And of course, this use case is very similar to the first one, code generation, but there is a very important distinction that we are going to discuss, uh, well, in a moment. And lastly, you can use annotation processors to uh, gather some compilation metadata about your source code. Basically to gather some metrics, for example, about the source code, and then process these metrics in other tools. Now, one important distinction between code generation and resource generation is that code generation 
produces, well, source code. And as we said before annotation processors are executed, the source code should be compiled with the front end compiler into AST abstract syntax trees. And since annotation processors produces additional source code, then well, this <laughs> source code, additional source code should also be compiled by the front end. And therefore, when we use annotation processors that generate code, this basically requires additional front end compilation paths and in some cases, multiple passes. And this actually explains why code generating annotation processors like Dagger slow down your builds. They, well, first of all, they need to read the annotations, then they need to generate code. And after they finish generating the code, this code should be once again compiled using this front end compilation step. And therefore all that takes time, all that adds overhead during your build process. So this is the distinction between code generation and resource generation. In general, annotation processors are very powerful tools. They can allow you to achieve amazing results, but they come with their own trade-offs. And one of them is complexity, of course. And lastly, to conclude this lecture, let's just quickly review how we use annotation processors. Well, we use them by adding these dependencies inside our Gradle configuration scripts. So if you use Java, you add this annotation processor directive and then specify the processor that you want to use. And if you are using Kotlin, then you need to use Capt. Kotlin annotation processor tool, and then you again specify the annotation processor that you want to use. And of course, of course, you can also write your own annotation processors, but that's a very, very niche use case. And I would say that absolute majority of Android developers shouldn't do that, even if it sounds like a good idea in your case, because these tools are complex, they add complexity, and chances are that you don't really need them. And therefore, we are not going to discuss how to do that in this Android bit. Well, I hope that you found uh, this information helpful and useful, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.